Salute, prost, cheers. I'm Amanda Keller. I am the lead brewer at Big Dogs Brewing Company, and I will be co-hosting our mixology adventure today alongside Mark Steele, the owner and operator of Restaurant Hospitality Institute. So a little bit about myself. I've worked in food and beverage for about 14 years. I've been a bar back bartender, mixologist, bar and restaurant manager, and now I am in manufacturing and production. So I graduated with a hotel administration degree from UNLV. From there, I moved on to the Master Brewers program at UC Davis. I am currently a member of the Institute of Brewing Distilling and a member of the international nonprofit King Food Society, as well as their Las Vegas chapter leader and one of the founders. <laughs> So I'll elaborate more on my journey later on, but now I'm going to pass it over to Mark so that he can give us a little bit of an introduction and we can get some cocktails in our hands. Excellent. Welcome everyone. How are you tonight? My name is Mark Steele. I am the founder of the Restaurant Hospitality Institute. I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second, but I basically have been in Las Vegas for about 40, 45 years. Grew up in the restaurant business. I opened up big resorts like Bellagio, Encore and open, opened and operated restaurants all of the, up and down the strip for maybe about 15 to 20 years. Grew up in the restaurant business, started out as a busboy in my family's restaurant as I was growing up, but we'll actually talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, I'm a fourth generation uh, hospitality specialist. Actually, my great grand, my great great grandfather was one of the original brewers of Guinness way back in the day. Um, so I have some beer ties as well. But uh, currently, I opened up a business about five years ago. It's actually right down the street from UNLV, um, close to Spencer. It is actually called the Restaurant Hospitality Institute. And actually, what we do is we train uh, front of the house restaurant professionals. Um, we train everything from hospitality, food, liquor, spirits, which we're going to talk about today, artist service, um, sanitation is obviously a big thing. A lot of things who, when you're working in the restaurant business, you don't necessarily learn as you're growing through the restaurant with their training system. So we actually kind of bridge the gap. We do uh, re recruiting and place people into different um, restaurants as well. And we just started a couple of new programs due to the times nowadays. We actually just created three new programs that are based around uh, the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Um, and we're basically reaching out to local restaurants right now and training them on different standards because things are changing all the time. And we have state-of-the-art uh, information, stuff that's coming out all the time with my partner, Jimmy Vigilante, and his company, who is basically the top sanitation person in the state of Nevada. Um, we also do teach alcohol awareness. So if you might know it as a TAM card or alcohol awareness card, if you work in the state of Nevada, whether it be in a grocery store, cashier, restaurant, bartender, you're required to have an alcohol awareness card. Uh, we're actually certified to be able to do that as well. Um, so you can check us out, rightinstitute.com, if you can see that, or you can just come right down the street and uh, see us there. So, all right, great. Um, Amanda, are we ready to start making some cocktails? Is that the plan right now? Absolutely, Mark. Let's make it happen. Let's get going. Everyone's like, you know, it's five o'clock. Come on, let's have a cocktail. So, yeah. all right, well, welcome to my house. Obviously, we're all doing Zoom on uh, in the comforts from our own home right now. So this is actually, you know, Casa de Steel. This is where all the magic happens. And this is some of the training material that we do for the school. Um, so actually, we're going to start out and we'll get, let's get a drink in our hands and we'll, we'll talk about that. So the whole format is, is, you know, since yesterday was the 115th birthday of Nevada, we've actually put together four Nevada theme uh, cocktails. Um, uh, so we're gonna go through those. The first one is actually a simple classic, just to get something in our hands, something that we can drink, Las Vegas Tide, something's gonna be related to the weather that's coming up. Obviously we're about ready to hit triple digits. Uh, then we have something for the rest of the state, something that's, um, that I discovered recently up in Northern Nevada with a little bit of history behind it. And then we're gonna take it over to Amanda, which is something that's actually made in the state here with a lot of local ties and uh and we'll wrap it up and by the end of the class we'll have four drinks in front of us so you know feel free to chat if you need to have any questions we're going to take those at the end i know candace has those and those are going to be related to us afterwards so feel free to to shout some uh any questions that you have and we'll get to those at the end okay all right here we go so we're first going to start um with some, well actually this is something i want to share too and this is something that i share in my class in the restaurant hospitality institute we are certified by the commission on post-secondary education 
Um, and, you know, one thing about hospitality is, you know, everyone can sell a drink, everyone can sell food and you have your chef and you have your menus, but what's really going to separate you a lot of the times is, you know, is your hospitality and how are you going to separate yourself from other people selling the same product? A lot of it can be done by telling stories, simple things, simple facts, simple knowledge that's going to ingrained in the customer and they're going to say, wow, I learned that from this person. And it was just something simple that you learned somewhere along the way. Think about it when you go to a restaurant or if you go somewhere, you want to learn. That's why you're here right now. And, you know, we're going to show some facts to you. We're going to tell you different things about the products, the history, the story. So you can go in turn and, you know, you can win some bar bets. You can give some drunk history to your friends. And it's all meant to be, you know, fun and interactive. Because at the end of the day, you know, ultimately, the best upsell that you can make in any hospitality field is for your guests to come in a second time or a third time or be a customer for, you know, for life. And it all starts with your hospitality of how you're actually going to um, go ahead and, and, and share stories and make people feel comfortable, okay? All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is actually we're going to make a class one nice and simple uh, Jack and Coke. And this is, you know, entry level, but we'll start at the bottom and, and work our way up. And coincidentally, today is actually also international um, whiskey day in the in the entire world international that's why it's international so we're going to have a, a whiskey in our first couple of drinks um, we have decided something that's probably or we've chosen something that probably everyone has behind their bars so we didn't want people to go too crazy and getting stuff but we have a nice bottle of jack daniels here i don't know if you can see it with the glare but everyone should know what a jack daniels looks like so we're going to make a, a simple jack and coke so let's start with our just one of our glasses here. We have a glass and let's go ahead and fill it nice. This is going to be something we're actually going to build inside the glass. So we've got our glass with ice. You know, it's always important to mix stuff with a proper, uh, proper balance of everything that the drink is supposed to have. So, you know, it is important to use a jigger with different drinks. So we're going to use, I believe we have two ounces of Jack Daniels in this one. So we're going to go ahead and pour it. You know, if you're in quarantine, maybe you've already had a little bit more, maybe you want a little bit more, but this is a good, uh, a good start of two ounces. And then we're going to have a nice, another American uh, traditional is, yeah, is uh, Coke. So we're going to go ahead and just top the rest of the glass of it, which should be about five ounces in a, in a Collins glass. And then we're just going to go ahead and mix it up inside the glass. We don't want to shake it up. I mean, too much ice will melt and dilute the drink and mix it up. All right, so here we go. That was a simple one. Hopefully everyone's able to do that. So cheers. Here's our first drink. And let me give you a little, little hint also on service uh, because that's what we do at the Restaurant Hospitality Institute is when you're serving a drink to someone, obviously you always want to make them a drink first, but now it's just me, so I can just make the drink for myself. But when you're serving a drink for someone, we're also very uh, prejudiced towards people who are right-handed. So when you're serving a drink to someone as a bartender, or as a server, you always want to place it to the right-hand side of the guest. All right, so I'll go ahead and give it to you right on that side. You know, go ahead and take it. Excellent. All right, cheers. We'll go ahead and sip it, and then we'll talk about Jack and Coke for a little bit. Nice robust drink for us to start out with. I hope you have a, some food in your stomach already. So Jack Daniels was first mentioned in um, looking back in the history in 19, uh, 1907. And the reason why is because yeah, bourbon and whiskey are pretty strong, robust drinks. We'll talk a little bit more about the difference in bourbon a little bit later. But the whole reason was to mix it with Coke is to make it a little bit more drinker friendly for people who didn't always just want bourbon and just want to drink the bourbon. It obviously originated in the South. And so, you know, Coke and Jack Daniels kind of have very, very similar qualities into it. Caramel, you know, strong and robust. The carbonation cuts right through the alcohol. Uh, but, you know, it's a very, very good uh, combination for it. So, so you're probably asking me, okay, the South, Jack Daniels, Coke, what does this have anything to do with Nevada? All right. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story is that Jack Daniels was uh, founded in 1866. Um, but right around 1955, you know, they were just a very local, um, just a regional whiskey maker and people who wanted it there, that's, that's what they drink and that's what they had. But all of a sudden, 1956, their 
they literally doubled their sales of what they normally do. And they were doing about 150,000 cases a year and they literally doubled to what they, what they normally do, did. And you know, this, was, this was 1955, 1956 where there wasn't technology, there wasn't a lot of different ways to tell um, why, you know, where, where the analytics was coming from and, and how it found out. But anyway, they kind of got to the end of it and they actually had two decades of shortage for a long time. So it took them a long time to recover. And the reason why is, because of, we're going to share the screen, because uh, Frank Sinatra, Frank Sinatra is obviously known for being, you know, a big patriarch of, of Las Vegas. And we have Frank Sinatra Boulevard that runs right de parallel, right with the Las Vegas Strip. And he performed here for, you know, where you, for however long he did. He performed here for a long time. He used to call it the nectar of the gods. And the reason why he was kind of thought of as a first brand ambassador of Jack Daniels is because Whenever he went somewhere to perform, and obviously he was kind of the bee's knees back in 1955, is wherever he went, um, he got up on stage, he told everyone it was the nectar of the gods, and of course, Frank Sinatra was cool as can be, so if he's drinking it up on stage, what did everybody else want to do? Everybody else wanted to drink it, so of course, all, wherever he went, he required for the, uh, the stadium or the performance areas to actually have Jack Daniels, and then all those people who were there, they went back to their homes, they went everywhere else and then they demanded Jack Daniels just because uh, Frank Sinatra was a big fan of it. Um, so much so that, that Jack Daniels actually has their own uh, brand of Jack Daniels Sinatra. All right, so here's a nice big bottle of it right here. We're not tapping into this because this is a, a higher level of it. We'll tap into it later while you guys aren't watching so we can see it and enjoy it. All right, there's a bottle right there. And you know, my, you might think of some of these stories as myths and stories and, you know, where did the history of this come from? But I can actually tell you from firsthand, and I'll give you a little bit of my family history, is actually my father used to work at Caesar's Palace back in the day and actually literally used to bring Jack Daniels to uh, Frank Sinatra. And right before he went up on stage, he put a, have to put a case in his dressing room and he would drink it right before he went on there. So you can see there's a picture of myself and my dad um, at a restaurant that he uh, went to here in Las Vegas for his 100th birthday. And uh, that's, uh, that's a little bit of history with tying the, all of us together. So um, another couple of fun facts about Jack Daniels that I didn't know until I was preparing for this, this webinar here is you can actually, if you want to stump your local bartender, you can actually call it a Lemmy if you want to ask for a Lemmy, L-E-M-M-Y. And this is because there was a very popular a uh, musician who was the lead singer of Motorhead, um, and he passed away in 2015, and his name was Ian Frenzer Kilmister, which of course, uh, I'm not saying pronouncing it very well, but he actually drank Jack, Jack Daniels religiously as well, maybe not as famous as Frank Sinatra, but you know, if you go to your veteran bartenders and ask for a Lemmy, that just actually uh, should give them a, a Jack and Coke for you, so. All right, that's about all the facts I have for Jack and Coke. Is everyone enjoying it? I know it's pretty tasty over on this, over at uh, Casa de Seal here. Why don't we go ahead and hand it off to Amanda for our second cocktail. Amanda, you ready to go? Absolutely, Mark, bravo. Loved that information. Yeah, thank and you. Thank that you. last slide that you showed, the golden steer, that's where I did my internship, if you remember. Yes. For yes. Uh, graduation from Great. the hotel college. So mm -hmm. very awesome. So now we're going to take um, the Jack and Coke that you just made and we're going to put a little bit of a spin on it. So I have a couple different um, shakers here. So I'm going to use the Boston shaker to begin with. The second cocktail that I make later, we'll use the cobbler, the three piece. So whichever one you have at home is going to work just fine. So we're actually going to build it in the clear glass. I have my Collins glass here. Grab a couple of cucumbers. Put it in there and we should have our muddler. And we're going to give that a little bit of a muddle. Break down the cucumbers. So when you are making a cocktail, I always like to start with the inexpensive ingredients first. 
So that way, if you make a mistake when you're building it, you can toss it out and start it over and you're not having to throw out your Jack Daniels. So on this one, I'm going to get out my uh, jigger here. And this is a pretty old uh, vintage um, one, has a leather handle. And if you'll look, most jiggers are going to say like what size they are and a lot of them are different sizes. So we're gonna start with our simple syrup. Now this is, not a regular um, bottle. It's actually had something else in it prior, but I made my own simple syrup. And I just used one cup sugar, one cup water. So I'm going to put a half an ounce of that into my glass. And now we're looking for a half ounce of lemon juice. So I have a lemon here, put it in my Little squeezer, squeeze about a half ounce in there. Grab my jigger again, and now we're gonna go for an ounce and a half of the Jack Daniels. We're gonna add some ice. Is everybody following along, keeping up? Mark, you're looking good. We'll put the pin on, flip it over, have the glass to our back, and we're gonna shake it for about 10 seconds. Give it a shake, good shake. Shake it like you mean it. strainer and we're going to strain it into the Collins glass and I have to say this is delicious on its own but now we're going to grab some coca-cola and I'm going to stir it in there So for a garnish, if we want to get fancy, we can take that cucumber and we can take a peeler. We can peel off some of the cucumber. We can just grab a toothpick. And we'll just start feeding the toothpick through this. Of course, if I were working in a restaurant, I would have gloves on, but I'm at home and it's for me. Amanda, we won't tell anyone. <laughs> so now we have this, I don't know if you can see it, little spiral of a cucumber, and we'll put that on top. And this is extremely refreshing. So it's not just a catchy name. It's a Jack, Jack Daniels uh, refresh, huh? Oh, it's so good. Yes, Jack Daniels refresh. And you, can, and you can easily make a few of those or a picture of that by the pool. And I actually made one right over here if you're watching. And I'm going to give it to my, my co-founder and wife right over here because she very much enjoys a drink, actually, before I have to sip. Make sure it's OK. Yeah, so now we have a couple cocktails in front of us. So we can go ahead and talk more, I guess, about me and uh, my journey in the beer industry. I do get a lot of questions about how I got into brewing. And it really all started back when I was attending UNLV and I was working in the food and beverage industry. And I like to drink beer. But more than that, I really had a curiosity as to how beer was made. And so I started to do some research, and my research led me to the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. It seemed to be, if you wanted to be a brewmaster, that needed to be on your resume. 
and that is located in England. And so I knew that I probably wasn't going to go to England. However, UC Davis had their Master Brewers program, and that Master Brewers program did lead, lead you up into the exams uh, for the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. So as I was attending UNLV, I looked into the prerequisites for the Master Brewers program, and of course there was some microbiology and biochemistry prerequisites and heat mechanics and physics and uh, math requirements. And going to the uh, hospitality school, I had taken astronomy and uh, biology for non-majors. So I decided to postpone my graduation from UNLV a little bit to take the prerequisites for UC Davis. And I was fortunate enough to be accepted, but I was waitlisted as they only accept 40 students a year into that UC Davis program. So after graduation from UNLV, I was able to go to UC Davis and learned under industry greats, uh, Dr. Michael J. Lewis and Charlie Bamforth, who at the time was the president of the Institute of Brewing and Distilling, and uh, spent some time out there and graduated from the program, at which time it was really important for me to move back to Las Vegas. This was five years ago. The beer industry is still emerging and still expanding here, but even more so five years ago. So when I got back, I did a short internship for Bad Beat Brewing. And two weeks into my internship, I was hired on at Big Dogs Brewing Company. And I've been with them for five years. And to my surprise, four months into uh, being hired at Big Dogs, the brewmaster of almost 20 years left the company, which uh, left a spot open, and I was promoted to lead brewer, which is where I'm at today. So um, very, very exciting career for me. And as I mentioned before, I'm also a member of the Pink Food Society. So that's an international nonprofit that was started here in the United States. And its main goal is to assist, inspire, and encourage women in the beer industry profession to further their careers through education. And about a year ago, we did not have a Las Vegas chapter. And myself and Linda Lovelady of Lovelady Brewing, uh, we decided it was time to start a Las Vegas chapter. We have 12 members. And now we raise money for scholarships for our members. And uh, that's a, a big part of, of what I like to do on my spare time outside of brewing. So cheers, everyone. Here's a man, a great story. Congratulations on all the success. Thanks, um, Mark. And just to go ahead. Now pecan punch time, I think. Pecan punch. Well, actually, I want to share a little bit more about um, about Jack Daniels and bourbon. Actually, kind of give the people some more information than just uh, than just the mix and the recipes. So you know, we will talk about Jack Daniels for a little bit. And actually, I'll tell a little bit about how Amanda and I know each other. And this is also important as everyone's growing in their career students or alumni, you know, Amanda and I have actually met when she was actually a bartender and I was uh, working on the strip somewhere and we got to know each other and, and uh, before you know it, we just stayed, stayed connected in each other's networks and now actually um, every time that I have a graduating class, I bring them right over to, that's part of the program, the RHI, and we go over there and Amanda takes us through a tour of the brewery. So it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. It's something that, uh, it's not something you get a chance to every day is actually go to talk and, and deal and, and, and meet with a brewer and actually see what they're doing and see their passion. So kudos to Amanda in, in her career and how far she's gotten so far. So um, I'm gonna chat a little bit more about Jack Daniels since we're on there. It's actually the oldest registered distillery in the United States from 1866. And if you can do the math, with, which I was talking about with Frank Sinatra, um, 1955 is when their sales peaked. So they were basically making Jack Daniels even uh, almost 100 years before it really, really became uh, popular. Right now it's 10 million cases sold every single year in over 170 countries. You know, you'll see the number seven on here. The number seven, um, no one really knows what it means. Maybe Jack Daniels does, but you know, there's a bunch of different stories and you can read different things about what it actually does mean, but no one actually really, really knows. And the, the distillery itself gets about 250,000 visitors a year, which actually seems like a lot of people, so. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about bourbon. Uh, Jack Daniels is actually a Tennessee whiskey, but everyone's heard of bourbon and what the heck is the difference between a Tennessee whiskey and a bourbon? 
Well, I'll explain to you a little bit about what bourbon is. Bourbon is actually the only indigenous spirit here in the United States. Uh, the history comes from whenever the Revolutionary War happened and we signed the Declaration of Independence, we were actually right along the coast, all the 13 colonies, right? And then all of our forefathers were thinking, well, how the heck are we gonna start building this country? Now, we're, now we have this country, now we're ready to grow, now we're ready, ready to build, so uh, what do they do? They have to start traveling west. So what they did is they actually said, all you farmers or aspiring people who wanna help us grow the country, can you go ahead and we'll actually start giving you free parcels of land if you start making food and growing food for the country. And so, you know, a lot of people, of course, wanted to do this. And at the time for, especially right around the South in Kentucky and Tennessee, the easiest grow was corn. So they started growing corn all over, the all over the place and they started feeding our country. So of course, if you look on any history between alcohol and, and the history, you kind of see the correlating, correlating things and they actually started making alcohol out of it. So they actually started making spirit out of corn. Um, so that's actually kind of some of the rules of, the, of a bourbon. A bourbon actually has to be made in the United States. And of course there's certain rules you have to follow just to be a bourbon. It has to be brew made here in the United States. It also has to be at least 51% uh, corn mash, so it's got to be made out of at least 50, more than half corn. And actually what they do, because when it comes from corn and it comes out, it's actually clear and actually like, it's like moonshine, it's like vodka, it's a clear spirit. So how does it get its color? So when they came over from, um, from England, there was a lot of wine barrels because people were bringing wine barrels from them. So they're like, how can we use this? How can we help us with the, make the spirit into something else? So they would actually take the char the barrels and they would char the inside. They would roast the inside, put them on fire. So all the natural caramels from the, from the wood would actually come out and brown the inside. So now they would actually take that spirit now and put it inside there, which is why it gets this color, why it gets the charred, uh, smoky caramel flavor to it because it comes from sitting inside of these barrels. So that's actually the number uh, three rule of what it takes to be a bourbon. And then also um, it has to be, it can't be, the distillant can't be more than 160 proof and it can't be, um, it has to be bottled right around 40, 40 proof as well. So that's what makes it, that's what makes it uh, bourbon. And Tennessee whiskey, from what I understand, is they actually take, a, take it through a process, a whole different process, even more than bourbon. And they actually take the distilled spirit and put it through charcoal, like a filtering mechanism with uh, maple syrup around the outside that actually just kind of takes a lot of impurities out and also adds a little bit more of a, a complexity, a sugar into it as well before they put it inside the barrel. So that's, uh, that's in essence, Tennessee whiskey there, okay? All right, um, do you know anything about Jack Daniels? You know, I just did want to jump in real quick and say that bourbon and Jack Daniels barrels really are our favorite to age beer in when it comes to whiskey barrels because it is new American um, oak barrels that they use. So they use them one time. And when we're using other spirits, they're using bourbon barrels. So, you know, a scotch and Irish whiskey, um, they're using used bourbon barrels. So then by the time we get them, they've already been used several times. Even like tequila barrels that we'll get to age beer in are Jack Daniels barrels. So they take Jack Daniels barrels and then they'll age their tequila in it. And uh, so we really do get a nice flavor profile from bourbon barrels and Jack Daniels barrels and aging beer. So it's our favorite. Awesome. Do you want to tell us something about your, uh, your Jameson program that you have over there too, Amanda? Absolutely. Uh, so this is now the fourth year that Big Dogs Brewing Company has uh, been with the Jameson Castmates program. So uh, originally there were 12 breweries. I think we're up to like 17 or 20 breweries in, in all of the United States and we're one of them. And every year they give us about 30 barrels and we have free reign to age whatever we want in them. And we'll usually uh, premiere those at the Great American Beer Festival in September. So every year they give us, uh, ship us Jameson barrels right from Middleton, Ireland to us. And uh, we usually get them in January and we have uh, about 10 months to age in them. And so yeah, we're really excited for what we have going on right now. We have uh, three different beers. We really try to mix it up every single year as to uh, the different beers. And uh, so we're really excited for, for the variation that we have coming out in September. That's pretty awesome. And if you haven't been to Big Dolls, get down there, have some beers, have the Jameson beers. They're 
Amanda does a great job down there. She's not pumping herself up enough. So, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the next drink, the Pecan Punch. So this is a drink that I was not really, even in all my vast drinking knowledge and experience, it's something that I wasn't even really um, exposed to. But my wife and I, right at the beginning, at the end of, right after Christmas, actually, we decided to take a road trip around Nevada. And right around that same time, uh, we were kind of planning a trip. And uh, for those of you inspiring foodies, I get a magazine called Severe Magazine, which uh, comes out, I think, once every like two or three months. And I was looking through there right while we were planning the trip. And I found out about this drink that was made in Northern Nevada. And I was wondering why the heck I've never had it or heard of it or anything like that. So immediately where we were going and what we were going to have. And you know, if you haven't taken a trip around Nevada and really learned about our history, I'm not going to go into big Nevada history right now, even though it's Nevada's birthday, but we're going to talk mostly about this, about this drink called the Pecan Punch. So um, in Northern Nevada, there's a lot of influences um, of the Basque community. Okay, and if you don't know what the Basque is, Basque is kind of a uh, sub-region of maybe the area right in the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain, um, right on the, um, right kind of like on the ocean right there. And they don't really, they have their own different language and they don't really have their own, you know, their, their own home, but they have their own culture in there. So, um, you know, during the times, and, and so neither of the countries really, really uh, took ownership of them. So they lived of them a lot in poverty and they lived in, they, they were like sheep herders and things like that. But of course, they all liked to drink because they were in the middle of, uh, of nowhere and sheep herding. So one of the things that they used to drink a lot was a drink called uh, pecan. Okay, and pecan is a after dinner liqueur. Actually, you can have it beforehand as an aperitif or as an af afterwards as a digestive because it's, it's got enough alcohol in there to kind of warm your stomach up and get ready when you're starting to eat. But it's also thick enough with a lot of herbs that you can drink it afterwards because it kind of coats your stomach after a big meal. So this particular one actually comes a little bit more from Northern France, but they used to drink it a lot in the Basque region. And they used to drink it as accompaniment with beer because it was so strong and so thick and so heavy. Um, so, but it also has a very, very strong essence of distilled orange and orange rinds in there too. So a lot of strong herbs, very thick. You can kind of see my version right here is, is, is very thick in itself. And it is very similar to a Amaro that you might find in, in um, Italy. Um, but once you started going, once we started driving right above Elko in Northern Nevada, no matter which bar that we went to, um, no matter smaller hokey doke bar or big bar or big restaurants, every place had a, had this. And I was just thinking to myself, how could I have never heard of it or, or, uh, or even knew about it? So this is something we want to talk about because the Basque, community, actually what they ended up doing is because they were living in poverty, they started coming up, they tried their hand going to South America for a long time and things didn't really seem to work out there. So they started heading up because they heard about this gold rush and all this mining up in Northern Nevada. Um, so uh, they went up there. Um, and I'll tell a little bit more because I know everyone's waiting for a drink. So I'm talking too much. So they normally have glasses, especially made for them, pecan glasses. We ordered some, but we didn't get them in. They're in Louisiana here right now ironically, but uh, so we're going to use a wine glass very similar to this, so a smaller glass. So the first thing we want to do is we want to take some grenadine and we want to go ahead and take an ounce of grenadine. Uh, I'm sorry, about a half an ounce. And we're going to pour it into our glass. And keep in mind, no matter how busy these bartenders are, that they're making you these drinks whenever you, whenever you ask. So you're going to go ahead and you pour the grenadine in and you're gonna kind of coat the glass and you're gonna take it and you're gonna pour it all the way around. You can see it's thick. And I know we talked last week about legs and you can see the legs of this grenadine just kind of sticking to the side of the glass. All right. So obviously so we're gonna have some left so you're gonna put it right in there. And then you're gonna use some crushed ice. So you can muddle some normal ice or you can have your your own place to do it, or you can use regular ice for the time being, but you're gonna go ahead and fill the entire glass. And if you've been to Northern Nevada, you know it's very cold up there. We went during winter time, which it was even colder, but um, so, but once you drink the pecan, it definitely warms you up and you'll, you'll figure that out really quickly. So you, you fill up the whole thing with, with ice, with crushed ice. And then we're gonna go ahead and take our pecan, of which we um, have a American version of the pecan right now. And we're gonna put two ounces in here.
And you can see it's so strong and so thick that it's kind of melting a lot of the ice already. All right, so that's going to go in there. Now we're going to fill it up with soda water, but not all the way to the top. So it's, they call it active water. So just get a little sparkling, a little carbonation, a little something to cut through all that alcohol. And then, you know, we want to be very sophisticated. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to put some cognac as a floater on top. So I know maybe some of you can see my bottle of, of Louis that I have right back there. We're not going to use that. We're not going to go all the way to the top, but we got a nice bottle of Cavassi VSOP, very special old pale. And we're going to take this and we're going to just kind of leave it as a floater right on the top. So now we have our drink built. You're just going to do a small mix inside the glass. And again, no matter where you went in Northern Nevada, they treated this like a science experiment. And then on the top, we're going to take our lemon and we're going to take a small lemon rind, just the same way that Amanda really did the, the cucumber. And we're going to take the rinds and we're going to cut it as a garnish. And it doesn't really add too much to flavor, but a little history of a lot of the, um, a lot of lemon rinds that you might find are because a lot of people wanted lemon rinds on their drinks 100 years ago or 150 years ago because water quality wasn't that good. So therefore the sanitation for the glasses wasn't that good. So you wanted to make sure that where you were drinking was sanitized and that was a nice, quick, easy way to do that. So you went ahead and you put the drink and put the garnish all the way around the outside and you put it right on top, all right? So cheers, we have our pecan punch. I'm gonna serve it to you to the right-hand side and cheers. And you're gonna go ahead and taste it. Very robust with a high alcohol in the cognac and the pecan. This is something that if you can imagine yourself, you're in the middle of the uh, Northern Nevada where there's a lot of mountains and it's cold weather. This is something that people who didn't wanna drink whiskey, this was something that was something a little bit, uh, you know, we'll call it, will warm you up and a little bit more mellow. Um, so the history of the, of the Basque community inside of Nevada is that, so they didn't do very well in South America. So they heard about this gold rush that was happening in, um, in California. So they said, you know, we got to try our, our luck up there. So they basically packed up from South America. They went up there and when they got up there, they started traveling West and they started traveling through Nevada and, but they didn't quite make it this Basque community. They didn't quite make it all the way to San Francisco and to where the gold rush were that they actually kind of stopped right in Nevada where there was a lot of mining going on for us as well with silver, okay? And they said, you know what? We don't need to really need to go any farther than this. So they just basically, you know, they basically lay down a uh, shop right up there and then they stay there and they became these very, very predominant sheep herders because um, the local community of all these miners that were coming up there, they needed food, they needed warmth with the wool and but sadly, all these vast community that came up there, they only bought X amount of pecan with them. So they sadly ran out. And once they ran out, they started making um, pecan the same way, but just with indigenous products. And that's why we have the uh, pecan kind of like we have it today. And they make it in several places. This actually comes from Fairfield, California. You can get bottles of pecan. It's still made in Northern France, but it is pretty pricey. But, um, but otherwise, I think that's... Uh, That's all I had to share. I think we have some pictures of some, some of our trip up there. We'll share the screen. That's myself having a pecan punch. You can see that, um, you can see that glass, right? That's the glass that I was kind of talking about right there. So it's not as big and deep as this. Um, so it's very strong. Um, I look very aristocratic in that. Oh, geez. And that's, in, that's in Virginia City, but you can go to any place in Northern Nevada in Elko, which is in the upper right, that's the Star Hotel, which, on it, which ironically is not even a hotel, it's actually just a bar with Basque food. Um, and then, you know, pictures of the pecan, and you can see what I'm drinking right there, and two bottles on the left-hand side of your normal pecan, which they keep under lock and key, but I guess I was nice enough that they let me take a picture of them, so. But you, we went to uh, basically every, in Winnemucca, in, in uh, Paradise Valley, in um, in Elko, everywhere up there was making this pecan punch and you would just walk in the bar and you would see bottles of pecan just lined up everywhere. So 
Very good. All right. Cheers, everyone. Be calm. You're going to have that finished by the end of the segment, right? This is my second, actually. <laughs> All right. Awesome, Mark. So now I'm going to work on making the Red Hound for you and uh, talking about the beer and everything that's going to go into the cocktail. So first, before we get to the cocktail, though, uh, it does have underbite IPA, double IPA in it. So I really want everybody to give it a try. First, without making the cocktail. That way you can really kind of see the transformation that's gonna happen from it just being a beer on its own uh, to a beer and a cocktail. And Mark's drinking it out of a can, which is fine, but uh, let's pour it in a glass. You, you don't have to, Mark. <laughs> so that way we can really get the aroma. I love that smell. And then I want you to take a sip. So this beer, double IPA, it's a West Coast style, so it's going to be pretty dry. Uh, does have uh, bitterness up front and uh, should have a lot of hop aroma and flavor. And really the hops that are significant in there are gonna add some grapefruits and some citrus, and you are going to get um, a little bit of pine in there as well. So there are six hops that are in here. The three that you're really gonna get on aroma and flavor are gonna be Chinook, Citra, and Amarillo. And uh, so when we are brewing these beers, and when I'm talking about grapefruit and citrus, it's not like we're adding fruit to these beers. This is all from the hops. And a uh, story behind Underbite. This was actually my very first commercially produced uh, recipe. And it was just supposed to be a one-time, one-off beer. I was gonna make it one time, maybe in the future, brew it a second time. However, we brewed it one time and it sold out so fast and we had such a demand for it. And I brewed it again and it sold out and a demand for it. And so we ended up making this double IPA a staple and uh, I've been brewing it year round now for about four years. And the dog on the label is my dog. So it uh, started off with a picture and I have the picture put on a canvas, which the original canvas is right behind me. And from there we took the canvas and had it made into this label and came up with the name uh, from the picture. So Underbite IPA. So, and it's, it's kind of funny too, because it is Underbite IPA. However, it is anything but an Underbite. Uh, so we like that as well. Now it's time to make this cocktail, cocktail. <laughs> so we'll put this aside. And for this one, I'm going to use the three piece cobbler. And again, we'll start with uh, the inexpensive ingredients first. So we're going to take our simple syrup and we're going to add an ounce of simple syrup. And a variation that a friend of mine, Sarah Gage, who is a wonderful uh, mixologist and bar woman, she actually made her simple syrup using underbites. So that's a great option if you want to have a little bit more of that bitterness come through too, because it does. And, uh, and I actually did make it, um, it's fantastic. So you can also do instead of a cup of water and a cup of sugar, you can do a cup of underbite and a cup of sugar. So a great variation to that. So we're going to use ruby red grapefruit juice and we're gonna um, really bring out the grapefruit notes in the beer. So do an ounce of that. We're gonna do a splash of the lime juice. And they did not. And then we'll take our vodka. And we're gonna do an ounce of this. A lot of cocktails you make, it's going to be uh, like one part sweet, one part sour, two parts strong. 
However, we are going to uh, just do one, 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 one because this is a double IPA, 8.7. So we're going to be adding a significant amount of alcohol when we do add in that double IPA. So I'm going to add ice to my pint glass. My ULV. And now ice to the cobbler shaker. We'll put the lid on here and we'll give it a shake. And shake it like you mean it for about 10 seconds. All right. And I'm going to pour these in at the same time. So we're mixing as we're pouring. And I think you'll be surprised even if you didn't think that you could ever like an IPA or a double IPA. This is a very interesting um, cocktail. So yeah, let's give it a try. Cheers. Oh, delicious. So um, I know that we've been talking about hops and really what are hops? So hops are from the plant Humulus lupulus and they are the female flowers from uh, this particular plant. Hops grow on hop vines uh, with a B, not a V, and as they grow up, they grow up in a helix. So they will add bitterness. So you see the lupulin glands, that's really uh, what, we're, what we're looking for. So the lupulin glands are going to have the oils that we want that are going to give the aroma. It's going to have the resins that we want that are going to add the bitterness to it. So when we talk about bitterness, hops in itself, they're not bitter. You have to boil them to become bitter. And so early hop additions in the boil on our brew day, those are going to add bitterness to a beer. Later additions in the boil, those are going to be our flavor additions. And then because those essential oils will boil off, we, and IPAs especially, will do a process called dry hopping. And dry hopping is basically adding additional hops to the fermenter either during fermentation or immediately after fermentation is finished. So, most breweries, some breweries do use whole, whole cone hops, but most breweries, we use hop pellets. So this is Chinook, and we have the hop flour. I don't know if you can see it. It is hammer milled and then pelletized. But we can break these up, and we'll do what we call a hop rub. And so you'll rub it in your hands, and you'll smell it. So then you can see what kind of uh, aroma you're getting from those. And every hop has uh, different DNA, so you're going to get different characters from different hops. And of course, you hear terroir in wine. Well, it is also true in so many other things, including uh, hop growing. So a lot of the Chinook hops that I talk about in uh, brewing this beer we contract them both from Washington. Washington is what we use in the boil, and we dry hop really only with um, Chinook from Michigan. And uh, it's the same DNA in the hops. However, um, we do get different characters in the hops that come from Michigan, and we like those in the dry hop. So we go ahead and, uh, and contract those out. So now we've been talking about hops and India Pale Ale. So where does India Pale Ale come from? Um, especially because it originated in Britain. So why is it called India Pale Ale? So it was uh, basically just porters were very popular in the um, 19th century. And 
this beer was just made with a little bit more hops and it had a slightly higher attenuation. So it had less residual sugars after fermentation. And um, there were great trade routes between Britain and India. And uh, it was a popular beer that was sent to India. And from there, by the 1900s, you could find them brewed in countries all over the world, including America. And now American IB IPAs are a very distinct style, very different from English IPAs. And as a matter of fact, American IPAs are different in all regions. So a Northwest IPA is very different from a Northeast IPA, um, which is different from a Midwest IPA, which is different from what we are drinking now, which is a West Coast IPA. Um, so yeah, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we have going on at Big Dogs as we are enjoying this hop tail. Nice glass. So, Nice glass. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so we're going to be doing a virtual beer fest, you know, in this quarantine time. So go to bigdogsbrew.com May 30th. We are doing a vir virtual beer fest at 4 p.m. So I'll be on there. The other brewers will be on there. Um, Dave and Mahoney, the 107.5 morning show, they're going to be a part of it. And so we'll have uh, several different beers and we'll be drinking beer and talking about beer. So that's May 30th at 4 p.m. And so many things are being pushed off right now. Normally I do a brew school twice a year. Mark has been to brew school. And we usually do it in January and June. The June has been postponed. So we don't have a date yet on that. But it's basically where people can sign up and they can come spend a Saturday with me and see how a beer is brewed um, on a brew day. And so it tends to be a lot of fun. And so keep an eye out for that. And um, the Pink Food Society, the local Las Vegas chapter, we do something really fun every November. And I really hope that we can do it again this year. It's called It's Not Water, but it's on Water Street. And we close Water Street down and we hold a relay beer run. All you need is four people that can run a quarter mile each and maybe chug a beer. So uh, yeah, that's what I have going on. Um, we hold beer fests, and so just stay tuned. I think like um, go to our Facebook page, Big Dogs uh, Brewing Company, and the Pink Booth Society Las Vegas chapter. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and see uh, what events we're gonna finally be able to hold. Wow, right. awesome, Amanda. A lot of information. I hope everyone was taking notes. I have a question for you for all of us beer uh, kind of enthusiasts. When you see um, uh, a designation on a bottle or somewhere that says IBU, what does that mean? All right, so that's the International uh, Bittering Unit. And so the calculation really goes by several different things. So you're looking at alpha acids present in that particular hop. You're looking, uh, so the higher the alpha acid, the more um, like bittering units you're going to get from it. The earlier on in the boil you add that hop addition is going to add, increase your IBU. So like I said, at the beginning of a boil, you're going to uh, really add in your bittering hops. So you're going to go for a high alpha acid. Um, so you have to, you can add less hops to get a higher IBUs. But you really, as long as you're adding it in the boil, you're going to be drawing um, a bitterness from those hops. And then the other calculation is the amount of sugar that is in the wort. And the wort is basically the sugar water that we get from the grain. And the, it's one of the factors that's going to determine the alcohol content of a beer. So a lot of sugar in the wort is going to possibly mean a lot of fermentation. There's other things involved in it. However, if you have a lot of sugar in your wort, you're going to hit a saturation point. And so the higher the, the sugar that's in there, the less you're going to have room to absorb other components like bitterness. And so that will actually, you have to add more hops, more alpha acids into the boil because uh, I mean, it's just one of those things you want to add them early um, because you are adding plant matter in. So it's basically like those three things. 
it's going to tell you how many bitterness units are in it. However, you're going to perceive bitterness more in like a pale IPA like this than you would in an imperial stout. So you might have an IBU of 100 in an imperial stout, but because of the malt characters that are in your stout, you're going to perceive less bitterness or like a barley wine because you're going to have other things in there for flavor. But that's what you're looking at. Basically, you know, um, the calculation comes out that this is um, about 100 IBUs, possibly over, but you can't really perceive past 100. So I think it's 110, um, but there is a, a threshold of perception as well. Awesome. And just for, uh, for reference, if this is 100 or 110, what would something be mainstream like a Stella or something like that? All right, so um, Stella's you're probably looking maybe at like a 15. When you get to um, your light American lagers, you're probably looking at like an eight to 10. Wow. Yeah, so, so, so very far on the spectrum. Like for example, our um, uh, brew system is 15 barrels. Our Las Vegas lager, which is an American lager, we add about six pounds of hops for a 15 barrel batch. I add 69 pounds of hops to this beer. So it's, it's the um, In time, American so lager. Yeah, the hops are for balance. And in an IPA, it really is to give you that hot punch. Wow, amazing, wow. great. Yeah. Good information. Yes, thanks. All right, well, that, I think that wraps up our, uh, our drinks. We have quite a few in front of us right now. Are there any uh, questions that anyone has? Yes, actually, I do have a question for Amanda. What yes. is the difference between an IPA and a double IPA? So you're um, looking at alcohol content. Um, so this beer, this is a double IPA, we're looking at 8.7. And your regular IPAs, they're still really um, high in alcohol, but when it comes to alcohol by volume, you're going to average an IPA around seven. And then you're going to hear like the triple IPAs and those really are going to be 10, maybe above 10%, 11% alcohol by volume and you'll hear something called a session IPA. And so session IPAs, you can drink them over a session because they are tend to be four to five percent alcohol by volume. Great, thank you. Yes. Are there any other questions for Mark or Amanda? And I don't see anything else coming in right now. All right. Well, great. I hope everybody had a great time and learned some stuff and are enjoying our great cocktails. Yes, I, I have a whole night ahead of us right, right in front of me right here. And thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Amanda. This was so informative and loved all the history. Love the background of everything that you talked about. This was a great session. I can't wait to make some of these drinks a little bit later on this evening or tomorrow. Awesome, we appreciate Candace. having Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us your time today and coming out to do this for us. We really appreciate it. Go Rebels. Yes. Go Rebels. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for spending your Saturday evening with us and just wanted to remind you about some of our upcoming events. On May 22nd, we have our fourth episode of Cook Like a Rebel. Um, Chef Jessica Gordon from ChefWorks will be showing us how to make barbecue ribs and mac and cheese. So you definitely want to sign up for that. And on May 23rd, our third session of Salute Pros Chairs is going to be Got Bears with the Craft House Brewery team. Um, so that should also be another fun day of drinks. <laughs> so please feel free to go ahead and register for those sessions at uh, www.unlv.edu hospitality backslash events. Um, and then of course, if you've been taking pictures today of anything that you've made of any of the mixology that you've done, uh, pictures or videos, 
please share those with us. We'd love to see what you've been doing. Um, so follow us on social media, tag us in your pictures, and um, we can be found at, at UNLV Hospitality or at UNLV Hospitality Alumni. We are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So again, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Amanda. We appreciated having you guys with us this evening and um, look forward to another amazing session with you maybe uh, sometime in the future. We'll be available. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.